Good morning. I'm Sonia Abraham and I'm both a physician and a pharmaceutical physician. And I'm very privileged to be able to talk to you um, this morning on behalf of both the Royal College of Physicians and also the Faculty of Pharmaceutical Medicine. And I'm also privileged to be a member of both. Um, a little bit about my background. So I trained as a general internal physician along with rheumatology and immunology. I did a PhD in basic science as a welcome fellow and then transitioned into clinical translational research. And I think one of the wonderful things about doing medicine, but also going into pharmaceutical medicine, is that you're continually evolving. But the most important thing of whatever specialty to you do is really knowing your medicine. So what is um, the Faculty of Pharmaceutical Medicine and what is pharmaceutical medicine? Well, the vision of the faculty is that there is a world where effective medicines meet the needs of patients. Um, as physicians, we're all very good at diagnosis, but ultimately we want to heal patients and treat them with effective medicines and ideally cure them. Um, I have no um, financial interests or um, disclosures to note. And I want to um, sort of talk to you more about what it takes to be a pharmaceutical physician um, and also particularly an academic pharmaceutical physician. So what you need are education, training and skills that you acquire during your training. And all of these are applicable to the work of a pharmaceutical physician. Um, what the physician can do is bring value and synergize with teams to increase research and development of impactful, safe medicines to preserve and improve human health. Um, so what is pharmaceutical medicine? Um, well, the formal definition of pharmaceutical medicine is that it's a medical scientific discipline, much like any other specialty, such as cardiology, rheumatology, uh, neurology, but it's specifically concerned with the discovery, development, evaluation, registration, and monitoring, and the medical aspects of marketing of medicines, ultimately for the benefit of patients and public health. And it was actually um, only relatively recently that it was listed as a specialty in the um, European Special Medical Qualification. But the evolution of developing therapies has lasted a lot longer um, than that. And I think it's really timely that I'm um, able to talk about pharmaceutical medicine now. Um, there was a distinction almost that people who went into pharmaceutical medicine kind of left um, general medicine and the practice of medicine. But I think with the advent of the pandemic and now coming out of the pandemic, if it really hadn't been for the coming together of physicians in hospitals, um, in public health and pharmaceutical biotechnology companies, then we would still possibly be in a pandemic. But what have we evolved? We've evolved vaccines, which are now um, really helping eradicate um, COVID-19, but actually transforming the importance of development of treatments. So you want to be a pharmaceutical um, physician or academic. Well, these physicians are clinically trained and they apply the skills um, to discovery, development and evaluation of medicines. Um, they have to work in very strict pharmaceutical legal and regulatory frameworks. Um, and also have to abide by the same ethical and professional codes as um, we do in clinical practice associated with medical governance and minimising risks to patients and the public. Um, you need to be registered um, and retain a licence to practice with the GMC. Um, and engage in annual appraisals. So it's much like every other specialty that you may have enc encountered. Um, and again, they undergo revalidation every five years in the UK. So what is the role of the pharmaceutical physician and what do you cover? Well, you, 
there are lots and lots of subspecialties within pharmaceutical medicine and you can um you know it, it it's fluid you can you know really go into one subspecialty or you can pass between the various specialties this may include you know at the basic lab um science basic science translational level looking for drug candidates and looking how they may translate to proving the hypothesis which you may find in the laboratory into humans and designing first in human studies and phase one studies and studies in appropriate medical um, conditions. Um, in some ways, you know, we prescribe medicines and drugs all the time, but these have been tested and we generally know the side effects. But when you're working as a pharmaceutical physician, um, whilst you may have some um, ideas of what the side effects may be from um, preclinical data, you need to carefully monitor the patients who, for the first time ever, may be um, exposed to the drugs. Um, and you really get to learn about the drugs at this stage. So you need a lot of medical rigor and scientific rigor. And across all the development, you you know can subspecialize not just in clinical development, but also within drug safety and pharmacovigilance. Um, you may enjoy working in sort of a regulatory environment, um, and you will have interactions with the regulators across the world um, within the UK, it's our beloved MHRA, um, within Europe, the EMEA, and in the States, the FDA, or say in Japan, the PMDA. So you have really worldwide interactions with um, regulators. You may also be um, interested in medical and scientific um, affairs, and these are for sort of close to be licensed or post licensed drugs, and also in pharmacoeconomics. Um, what's important also as a pharmaceutical um, physician is the impacts and issues related to societal and public health issues in the wider uh, context of healthcare delivery and access to medicines. Um, and you know, working within um, the hospital, you may well um, have exposure to being taught, being trained, but also doing the training, say to medical students. Well, you know, teaching and training is also a very important part within pharmaceutical medicine, because you as the specialist in medicine may well be teaching scientists and other people working in the company about um, educating about diseases and the medicines. Um, you may also um, need to be able to communicate very clearly to external investigator sites and allied health professionals involved in the clinical trials that you're conducting. Um, and additionally, you can also evolve into becoming a pharmaceutical teaching academic. And more so now, there are joint um, university appointments for appointed pharmaceutical physicians and courses that run this. And additionally, medico-legal communications. So really, um, this is a um, roadmap of various roles that you can um, be part of within pharmaceutical medicine, right from the very early stages that I alluded to in discovery, um, very much, you know, basic science and translation, to really understanding clinical pharmacology, um, and then going on to further clinical development, pharmacovigilance and medical affairs. And this is not just a sort of one directional um, piece one can work in ver a variety of things for experience. Um, but again, one might um, settle in a subspecialty with one, within one of these. And as one involves one's career, you know, um, one might become a chief medical officer of a pharmaceutical company or a biotech. And really you need to have insights into many of these things as you evolve. So as I alluded to, there are very many roles that you can um, be part of um, as a pharmacologist, as a research physician, 
as a pharmacovigilance physician. Um, and it really, you know, is important that you can be central to the research and development of pharmaceutical companies. Um, so there are the large ones that, you know, people are well aware of. Um, but you can also be part of smaller biotechs. These are companies that um, maybe have discovered one molecule um, and then they can well be academic spin-offs because within academia, a lot of discovery is made, but then being able to translate it into a um, therapeutic is the role of these single product companies. Um, additionally, there are research organisations that help deliver clinical trials. Um, and additionally, physicians are really needed in regulatory agencies. So you work as part of the government agency in helping regulate drugs and reviewing documents sent to you for people who want to study um, new therapeutics. Um, and what's really important is this cross-functional interaction um, within um, pharmaceutical medicine. So within a hospital environment, you may well have cross-functional interactions between the different specialties and therapy areas. Well, within pharmaceutical medicine, there's both internal cross-functioning, um, not just with discovery and research and scientists and stats, but with um, legal part of the organisation, compliance, market access and health economics, accounting and financing, um, marketing and sales and medical information, and also external stakeholders such as academia, clinical practitioners, very importantly, the patients groups. And, you know, what we do in um, hospital medicine and clinical medicine is, you know, the patient is the heart of all we do. And that is just as important in developing the appropriate drugs to treat patients. Um, technology assessments, um, journal editors, because a lot of the research that, that um, is done, really, there is much more transparency now. And it's important that these are um, printed and um, in high quality journals and peer reviewed to share new knowledge and information. Um, and external um, interactions with well, World Health Organizations um, and other health protection agencies. And some people who become pharmaceutical physicians may well transition into some of these agencies. And really it is a two way street. So what are the skills that you require? Well, the most important thing that you require is really learning your medicine and knowing and experiencing treating patients in medical practice. Because what you do as a pharmaceutical physician is you bring the medical perspective, both from a scientific and clinical background, but also act as a voice to help um, for the patients and, 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 the health, and the public health at large. Um, so rather than treating one patient at a time, one thinks very much more of populations of patients, although the sort of holy grail of, of stratified and personalised medicine is evolving. Um, in clinical pharmacology and pharmacovigilance, you really require medical skills to be able to interpret data. What is it if somebody has a side effect related? Is it to the disease or is it to the medication to really try and bump up that package to look to evolve and create safe um, um, therapeutics that are effective. And one scientific knowledge and experience can also bring expertise to basic science um, to really help with that translational process to apply target discoveries of molecules into human disease. And nothing more so, a brilliant example of this is that discovery of anti-TNF, which I was privileged to be part of the Kennedy Institute of Rheumatology as this evolved, and that is targeting anti-TNF, and now it's a therapeutic in rheumatoid arthritis, but a lot of other autoimmune diseases. And what we can see in that is the roles of physicians in hospitals, the patients, basic scientists, and interaction with pharmaceutical development 
of monoclonal antibodies. So as I said, you really need to know your medicine, but you require other softer skills, which are very important. Communication skills, working in cross-functional teams, um, sometimes working at, um, at speed, um, deadlines within an hour, few hours. Um, so really having some resilience um, within that. Um, and really clinical experience is is invaluable in your role in industry. Um, specialist expertise, if you go on and specialise in a particular specialty um, or a subspecialty, can also have particular roles in research. If you were developing a drug in rheumatology or cardiology, having that expertise can definitely help, as well as in clinical development and leadership. Um, and so these are sort of the kind of requirements generally for a research and development post. You need to be medically qualified. So um, and a PhD can be of advantage and even more so people are doing MBAs as well, which combines both the um, business operational side with the medicine. Um, you need excellent clinical judgment. You need to really be able to synthesize and critically analyze data. Um, and get that from multiple sources so if you like research and you and, and reading and also communicating both in a written format and in a verbal format um, you have to be able to communicate complex clinical knowledge and development plans and strategies um, and you have the opportunity to publish um, within this specialty and you have to be able to work under pressure. Um, you also get to travel internationally, um, and this can be more or less depending on the role that you do, um, and you get to go all over the world, interact with multiple um, people, and also get to travel. I've been very privileged to be able to travel to the United States as part of some of my work, which um, may have been limited um, if I just continued in one specialty. So really it opens up a whole new world. Um, even if you don't do your research whilst doing classical clinical training, you do have opportunities if you come into pharmaceutical medicine to also do laboratory research and undertake a number of clinical rotations and exchanges, um, both between companies and academic centres. And this is evolving. So this is a quote from a pharmaceutical physician, and I'm going to read it out because it really does um, um, show his um, insights into this. So as a student and clinical training, he thrived in research environments and really enjoyed both clinical and science and found them both invigorating and rewarding. He then trained as a specialist registrar and found time limited resource to engage in meaningful research, which was frustrating for him. And he realized that a lot of groundbreaking research can be performed within pharmaceutical industry. And this attracted him to the career. And, you know, he hasn't looked back um, and has found it very rewarding and intellectually stimulating. And I would echo that. Um, from the time that I've also transitioned into pharmaceutical medicine. And there have been incredible successes um, in pharmaceutical medicine and pharmaceutical academics. This is our past president, Professor Tim Higginbottom, um, and he's had a, a brilliant career in academic medicine and medicines development. He worked in Adambrooks and Papworth as a physician. Um, he was a professor of medicine and then transitioned into um, pharmaceutical medicine. Um, and so he has done both research and also developed new therapeutics. And this is someone who's probably um, recognizable to you now. You probably saw a lot of him in the last few years, and that's um, Sir Patrick Valance. So again, he trained as a physician and as a scientist and as a clinical pharmacologist. He also then transitioned from academia into industry and then transitioned into holding a very high um, governmental role, really um, uh, developing that um, clinical science. Um, and, you know, as we saw, 
the importance of it in, in helping and supporting health and public health most recently. So really, um, the world is your oyster of whatever specialty to you, you do. But really, pharmaceutical medicine is something that you're able to come into at many stages in your career and can be really, really valuable. Um, and I really do encourage you to consider the noble profession of medicine and the subspecialty of pharmaceutical medicine at every stage in your career. And it's always evolving ecosystem. So the last piece of advice I want to give to you is know your medicine, know diagnoses, understand the patients that you treat and help develop the most efficacious and safest therapeutics to benefit human health. Thank you.